So it's very, very blowy here. I don't know how it is uh, your point of the mandala. Uh, I don't know if we've got the storms from Scotland in uh, Shropshire today. Uh, and monsoon like rains in Switzerland, I was hearing, we were hearing. So we're all in our different spaces. Uh, and perhaps there's a comparison there with our, with our minds too, we're all in our different, our different unique uh, minds, but with so much of the same architecture, if you like, the architecture is the same, but the, the uh, uniqueness, the expressions of it are very different. Certain sort of patterns. Um, so I just want to say a, a little bit more to start with by way of well, I've been talking about the mind and watching the mind, but perhaps just giving that a little bit of definition, um, which is not, uh, it, it's not something that um, we, can, we can do in a, a very uh, concrete way, I suppose. Uh, the, the mind, after all, it's an, it's an idea. It's a, it's a concept, it's a, to describe certain aspects of our experience. Um, we can't see the mind, we can't hear, uh, you know, we can't taste it, we can't touch it. We, it's, it's not tangible, there's nothing tangible about the mind. And yet we can know uh, the mind, uh, if not through uh, how its location or its color or its form, we can know it through some of its uh, functions, capacities uh, and activities. So the, the thinking mind, quite a big aspect of the mind, the mind that imagines, uh, so the imagination the mind that perceives and attends, uh, the mind that decides things, decides uh, what to do, what to think, um, and the quality of awareness. Uh, awareness is uh, an aspect of mind. Being aware, knowing, and we perhaps only know we have a mind because of all these different uh, qualities that, that come into view uh, as, we, as we use them, usually unconsciously. And in mindfulness practice, particularly watching the mind, we're looking to, to notice uh, when these qualities, when these capacities and functions are um, in use, if you like, uh, when, when, when they're uppermost, when they're arising. So we look very gently uh, at, uh, I think uh, we're, we're sort of looking um, back at the mind. We're looking at something that usually we look out from. We look out from the mind to the world. And perhaps we catch a few things. We, we catch what we're thinking sometimes. Um, when we're in meditation, we're doing much more of that uh, resting inwards resting inwards with our physical experience uh, and our experience of the mind overall. And I think why we have to look very gently and softly <clears throat> is because um, I think the mind is quite, a, it's a very sensitive uh, organ, easily disrupted and disturbed. I'm sure we all know that from, from our own sort of um, experience of the mind. We all have a lot of experience of our mind. Um, it's a bit like be, turning to look at an, an animal, you know, when there's, uh, actually I had an experience of this, a very simple experience, just sitting on a, bench outside the, the cabin where I am now just a few days ago in the sun 
and a blackbird just landed on the uh, a fence which was just above me and just to my left and without thinking I just I turned and I didn't turn particularly fast but choo, it was gone it was gone uh, so I thought if I'd been able to just be aware of that landing and stay and maybe just look out of the corner of my eye I probably would have got a, a glimpse of it so I think the the the, the mind is like that it's, oh easily easily um disturbed uh, so that's what we're we're learning to observe if you like observe these quite subtle capacities of our experience see how how they function uh, from the inside uh, so in this sense, we're not really looking at the content. We're not looking at, say, thinking in terms of what we're thinking necessarily. Uh, we'll usually know that. That's like a first level of knowing, if you like, the, the, the content uh, of thinking or the content of awareness. But there are other um, dimensions and other levels that, that we can become aware of. And particularly, we can become aware of, of, of the processes of the mind, our mental and physical processes. So how, how things are happening, uh, rather than the end result of what's happened. So uh, I gave the example the other day with the physical senses of, of seeing rather than um, the object the garden table at the end of the garden. Uh, it's the process of seeing that that being closer to home. So closer to the, the actual experience of, of what's happening rather than the object uh, that we've given a particular label to. So I, ha I have a, a little quote from uh, Sayadaw Ute Janir that I'm very fond of and he says, the mind is not yours, but you are responsible for it. The mind is not yours, but you are responsible for it. So we all know our, our Dharma. We all know, uh, in a way, the, the, about the empty nature of uh, self of it, and of experience. Um, so in that sense, the mind is not personal it's it's not mine and yet at the same time uh it has the capacity to grow it has the capacity to flourish it has the capacity to be more free uh, so that is where and it also has the capacity to suffer and that i'm sure we're very well aware of so if we're able to take responsibility for uh, the mind, then as we know, we, we have the opportunity to cultivate or to encourage certain qualities to grow, certain qualities that in, enhance uh, uh, freedom, enhance wisdom, enhance compassion. So it, it's always up to us what we grow what we encourage, what we develop. And uh, the, the two qualities that we were looking at yesterday, these two qualities of the four qualities of right mindfulness, uh, we're encouraging that receptive, open uh, mind that, that uh, by noticing its own biases, it can be a little bit freer of them by noticing its own judgments, its own tendencies. Uh, and seeing the suffering that they cause, we can, uh, th there's a certain degree of freedom from them. So I wanted to talk about these, the, the other two of these four qualities and, and maybe j just say uh, um, these four qualities that define right mindfulness that I mentioned yesterday. So this is mindfulness in its um, most fully developed sense. 
So it's mindfulness as a path factor, factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. So it, it already has uh, that thread of wisdom running through it. It has the thread, all of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path have that through their relationship with right view. Uh, if right view is in place, then um, that impacts on right mindfulness, right effort, um, right samadhi, and so on. So th th these are qualities simply by, by knowing about them. Um, perhaps they're, 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 that, that information is there at the back of the mind, but it can have an impact on the quality of the present moment mind. Um, so that, that's why we go through them to say it, it, it's not that these things will necessarily be in the mind when you're looking at them, but by, um, but by knowing about them, it's like, oh, is, is interest, is there any interest here? Is there, uh, oh, there's leaning forward in the mind. It gives us some handles on the territory of the mind. It gives us some things that we can think, oh, that, that's a helpful, I can feel that's a helpful quality in the mind or not. So I'm going to talk about the other two um, just briefly. So uh, really glad that a lot of you have been looking at the website, uh, the blog site. And um, yeah, so and been, you've been looking at the resources material. So some of what I'm going to talk about is is uh, is there, but hopefully uh, I'll just illuminate it a little bit more. And uh, yeah, I always forgot to say thank you very much for all the emails coming in. Really lovely to read about your practice. Mm. So the quality of uh, Sampajanya. This is pronounced in all sorts of different ways. Uh, Samprajana, Sampajana. So uh, I think this is the, a, a Pali way, it's Sam, Sampajanya. Clearly knowing clearly comprehending what's happening and it's almost synonymous with with sati with mindfulness and it's you, often used as a compound term sati samprajanya sampajanya uh, spelling you'll have to look it up <laughs> or look on the website look on the website <laughs> different ways of spelling it Or look in Analio's book, even better. Yeah. So Bante talks about this quality of clearly knowing as a, a spectrum. And so we can, uh, it's, it's knowing in the sense of understanding. And uh, at, its, at its deepest level, or on one end of the spectrum, it's, it's synonymous with wisdom. And Bante says that there's more than a touch of insight about this quality, this quality of clearly knowing. <laughs> so on one end of the spectrum is say you, you can um, simply know uh, the level that say on the level of sensation. So the sensations of the breath, let's say sensations of the breath. Uh, you can be present to them and by being present to them, uh, you, you recognize those sensations. On another level, you can recognize the nature of those sensations. You recognize uh, the empty nature of, of those sensations. So there's that whole sort of spectrum. And depending on the quality of the uh, Sati Samprajanya in any given moment, uh, and it will vary a lot, then you, you may be seen uh, quite deeply into the nature of um, an experience, the breath, the nature of thinking, the nature of awareness, or it may be quite simple uh, knowing um, thinking is happening, knowing uh, sensation is happening. 
and this this knowing it's important to say it's not discursive it's it's not a thinking about it's it's a, a, a quality of knowing in relation to direct experience and the knowing is not the same as the experience if you like we can we can have experiences uh, but experiences are different to understanding. And again, the understanding is not a, a, an intellectual understanding or a discursive understanding, but it's quite intuitive, uh, an intuitive knowing of this is, this is more how things are. So it's the second aspect just to touch on um, with Sampajanya, just before I say a couple of things about working with it in meditation. Uh, so it's connected with continuity of purpose, with knowing what we're doing and at any given time and, and why we're doing it and what relationship it has to our spiritual purpose and direction. So it's a bit like a compass. It, it's, it's like if, if our, uh, I, I talked about this in relation to right view, if we have got our, our spiritual compass pointing north, then if we're in touch with this quality of, of uh, Sampajanya, clearly knowing, then we'll sort of know quite quickly when we are not in line with that overall purpose and direction, spiritual direction like a spiritual rudder, that's the other way to describe it. Like it's helping uh, keep us on track, help uh, keep us oriented towards um, freedom, towards an understanding of the nature of our experience. So I think I've just paraphrased Bante there, but maybe I'll just read you what he says. So he says, we know what we're doing and we know how it relates to our overall spiritual purpose and direction. And he says, when, um, when this is not uh, current, when it's not uh, operating, when we're not in touch with Samprajanya, we lapse into spiritual unconsciousness. So just as um, Samprajanya is connected with wisdom, connected with insights and seeing more clearly, um, its, its lack is associated with delusion and not seeing clearly and this, what Bhante is calling spiritual unconsciousness. So it's, it's, that might sound a bit bad, but I mean, in a way, that's where we're, we're it's our starting point, isn't it, is 100% spiritual unconsciousness. So we're gradually becoming more and more conscious and having more moments of uh, conscious, um, consciousness and uh, um, alignment with that spiritual purpose and direction. So one of the little phrases that, that can be really helpful um, in meditation is, is just if, if we're, it can be a bit hard to, to just get a sense of um, uh, am I, is what I'm doing in line with my spiritual direction and purpose. Uh, but sometimes it, it can be more obvious. Perhaps, perhaps we're um, finding ourselves thinking a lot in meditation. There's, there's, we got caught in a story, and uh, just asking ourselves, is, is this helpful? Uh, is this necessary? Can sometimes be enough to cut through it? Can be enough to cut through a habit? Uh, if there's a lot of strong emotion caught with it, it won't necessarily do that. Um, but just sometimes, oh. No, it's not necessary, actually. Uh, we just sort of wake up. We do wake up out of that unconsciousness, sometimes just with a little, um, little prompt, a little reminder that 
uh, we don't have to go along with the habits that the mind uh, is caught in in that moment. Sometimes it can take quite a small thing to just unhook from being caught. Um, so that's that's it in meditation. Uh, in our, in our life, I think we can we can just assess. Uh, our choices assess our life choices assess how we use our time in the light of uh, our overall spiritual direction and purpose and um, I think with a recognition that we are not always going to act in we're not always going to be pointing north uh, or our spiritual rudder is not always going to be keeping us in that direction but at least we can know that we can recognize that uh, without without judgment um, and perhaps when we recognize it, we can also see, we can be curious about how it ends up. Uh, is it helpful in the short term? Is eating chocolate helpful in the short term? Um, reading an, a thriller. These are, those are two of my little pointing slightly off, off course. Um, sometimes in the short term, yeah, yeah. The helps the mind let go, helps the mind relax. Um, but as an ongoing habit, just it can help us be quite honest um, as long as we do it in this curious uh, way without an agenda, without a fixed agenda about um, but, but being true to, to what the experience actually is. Oh, actually, I can see that I read a certain number of thrillers within a certain period of time. I think I see a lowering of mood. Okay, and how is that? How is that? Is, is that helpful? Is that not helpful? Um, and that can help. That's, it can help me um, change my behavior from a different, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a less forceful way to try and do it. Um, it it's from really seeing from the inside what the effect is. And, and asking myself in a way what, 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 or seeing for myself what states of mind get encouraged by certain habits or behaviors. Um, are they necessary or not? And uh, sometimes it's helpful to say not. And to really know that, not just to say it, but to actually know it from the inside. I think sometimes it can be very helpful as well when there's when there's anxiety or worry in the mind. The mind is is just sort of going over something. Okay, is this is this, and we're not. Is this helpful? But but I, I actually I quite often hear Utejanir's voice, which is why perhaps I find it quite helpful. This in this Burmese accent, necessary or not, in this slightly sort of pidgin English and. Um, Oh, not quite necessary. So yeah, those questions, what, when we're working in the practice or in our lives, what's, what's helpful, uh, what's necessary? And this is after the question, what's happening? Just being clear to start with what's actually happening, what, what's going on in the mind. Okay, so the, the final one, the one with the big long name, uh, actually big long names in both Pali and English. So Vinaya Abhija Domanasa. I'm not going to spell that one. Somebody else might like to put it in the chat. Free from desires and discontent in regard to the world of sense experience. So there's a few key bits, but I think the, the, the key bit for me is the desires and discontent. Uh, free from desires and discontent, which uh, another translation, this is Devon's translation. He talks about removing longing and misery. Uh, so so there are ver there, these are versions of uh, either the hindrances. We can talk about those, those pulls, habitual pulls in the mind, particularly the the first two hindrances, 
Um, and they're also, it's also in the realm of craving and aversion. The desires and discontents, the things that we want and the things that we don't want. <clears throat> Um, so what, I think what this is what this is saying in 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 the practice is not that the mind is completely free from these um, these mental factors because that's what they are they're mental habits mental emotional factors uh, but they can but the mind that's aware can be free from them. Um, sometimes we can talk about this as the observing mind, thank you, or the witnessing mind, but the mind that's uh, aware of um, a, a, a discontent in the mind or a desire in the mind, uh, but is of a different nature, is of a different, is perhaps of the nature of um, some ease, some presence, some clearly knowing of what's happening. So this is where it can start to sound a little bit schizophrenic, talking about different, different minds. Uh, <clears throat> but in fact, we've got different, um, it, it, it's partly I think because we can think of the mind as a single thing. Uh, but actually if we think of the mind as something that's arising all the time and different in different combinations of different mental factors. Um, or a metaphor that goes the other way, it's like a, a water going over a waterfall. So it's just constantly moving, there's constant coming together and parting of different qualities of, of mind. Um, and that's again, going back to that little quote from Ute Janir, the, uh, the, the mind is not yours, but you are responsible for, for it. So, in a way, those sorts of, um, the, the every moment there's the chance to uh, impact on the quality of the mind that we have. Um, anyway, the different minds, the, the mind that's aware, what we're looking is for more moments of that stream of water going over the waterfall to be moments of awareness, droplets of awareness. Uh, and so those, those moments, those droplets of awareness uh, are not of the same nature as the moments of uh, desire, our desires, our cravings, our wants, our discontents, our worries. They all have their own natures. They all have their own sort of quality, but they can be known and noticed from the perspective of awareness. You can still feel, you're not cut off from the feeling of the mind that's craving, but you're able to observe it from a slightly different perspective. That of awareness and with some degree of um, wisdom already operating within the awareness. I hope that's, I hope that's clear. So this quality, uh, Abhijja, Vinaya, Abhijja Dhammanasa, there's a, a lot to do with acceptance in uh, this mental factor, accepting of what's happening. Often we can put ourselves in, um, what's the word? Opposition. We can put ourselves in opposition to factors that we'd quite like them to go away or not be there or we're worried that they're going to multiply. Um, so there can be quite an adversarial relationship to what's happening but with this factor we're looking to as as all the factors of mindfulness just to notice what's happening and see it clearly recognize what's uh, and if we recognize that there's some fear about the mind state or there's some judgment um, there's some um, opposition or, or uh, in how we're relating to that factor, then we can notice that as well. So th this is where the attitude of any object will do is really uh, useful because it takes, takes the attention off 
the object. And in this instance, say the object is something that uh, we desire or we feel discontented about. Um, and it puts a little bit more of the attention on the quality of awareness. Uh, the objects are simply there to uh, be known in awareness, to help awareness uh, become able to recognize um, with more continuity, with more, um, so that it's become a stronger factor in the mind. Um, and in this way, when awareness is a stronger factor in the mind, then uh, the factors of greed, of aversion and delusion no longer dominate. And remember, this is, this is momentary. So we can have moments where it's very, very clear uh, that uh, the, the awareness, awareness uh, and its friends, if you like, uh, those factors that support awareness, factors of meta and patience and, um, are in the ascendant and, um, and craving perhaps as you can almost feel it sort of um, calm down. You can feel it calming down in the mind. And it's really interesting to see that happen and see the, um, if you're watching the whole process, then you can have some understanding of what, why that happened. What were the factors in the mind that allowed something that was really quite uncomfortable and un unpleasant to calm down for the heat just to be taken out of it, uh, simply through observing. Uh, in a way, let, letting awareness do its work. So we encourage factors to, to, to grow, but we're not looking to actively interfere, at least initially. There are times when it's appropriate to do that, and I'll, I'll come on to those another time. So this, this quality... Um, Yeah, so when we, when we have that perspective of uh, we're able to be aware of um, something, perhaps something quite difficult in the mind without being involved um, in it, then there's a certain freedom from uh, our, yeah, our, our mental habits and patterns. And what we can discover is that our, our happiness is not dependent upon something pleasant happening uh, or something pleasant continuing. It's also not dependent upon something unpleasant stopping. And, and there's a lot of freedom in that. It's a temporary freedom. Uh, because conditions will change. And until there's a uh, strong um, understanding and insight in the mind, then, um, yeah, that, the, the different qualities will assert themselves and, until um, the mind, they've all been thoroughly sort of understood. But it does mean that we can experience, uh, rather than desire and discontent, uh, we can experience contentment, very strong contentment, um, and much less struggle in the mind. And this is really to be cherished. I think this is really precious. We see that through the quality of uh, the awareness that... Um, we've allowed to, to grow, that we've encouraged to it, certain qualities within it to grow. Um, that things that normally we perhaps wouldn't want to be in the mind, um, perhaps as a unpleasant memory or there's uh, of a conversation with somebody that didn't go well, or, but actually there can be quite a different relationship to it. Um,
Hmm. I wanted to say just a little bit about this in relation to um, into, to meta because people quite often um, understandably will ask about the role of meta in uh, Satipatthana practice because it's, it's um, not mentioned at all. Um, and also the role of meta um, as, a, as a more um, perhaps active way of working with disturbances in the mind and a way of cultivating positivity in the mind. Um, so what, what I find in my own practice is that it's, it's not always necessary. In fact, I would say probably more than that, it's not often necessary uh, within the practice to bring in metta. Uh, but if we really are in touch uh, with this sense of accepting whatever's happening, uh, allowing what's it within our experience to be there, but with awareness, um, that in itself is a really uh, metaphor thing to be doing. So actually it can give us confidence that metta is already there. It's already present. And why shouldn't it be? Uh, we've been practicing metta for a long time. Um, yeah, some of us for many decades, or several decades, and others for several years. So why wouldn't it be there? So if you, if you like just contacting that quality of acceptance, of allowing, of a, a, um, the kindly perspective that has the patience with what's present, uh, is willing to bear with it, um, yeah, from, from this, yeah. Uh, so that's not to say that at times it can be helpful and certainly to, to um, this, this is, I'm talking about within the, this particular practice, but that's not to say that at times outside the practice, of course, you'll carry on and you'll do your um, meta practice, your usual meta practice. I had a question this morning, actually, about uh, how to do the meta practice and whether there was a way that was um, compatible with Satipatthana practice. And I've been exploring this a bit myself, and I know that um, uh, other, others have as well. I think it's also been explored in the world of secular mindfulness quite a bit. Uh, so I, I will probably lead through a re, what I call a receptive metta practice or a receptive kindly awareness practice at some point, um, just, just to perhaps give a sense of how that can also work. Because there are many different ways of, of doing metta practice. There are a number of very traditional ways that uh, I think Analia has brought out in recent years, this um, radiating way of practicing matter. So yeah, a lot of scope there. Hmm. Okay. I think I'll leave it there for the time being. So let's, uh, do what we've been doing the last couple of days, just have a couple of minutes to just maybe move around, change your posture and then set ourselves up to sit and I'll, I'll lead through a sit.
So just settling into posture that supports awareness right now. That may be one of the four formal practices that uh, we all know and that Buddha laid out in the Satipatthana Sutta. It may be something, uh, yeah, you may choose to sit just in a, re a really comfortable chair or spread out on the sofa. Another way of talking about the quality of precision I mentioned the other day is I think sensitivity. So what helps us be sensitive to our experience in mind and body. What supports ease and relaxation? Along with clearly knowing Resting more in the present. And the awareness will naturally notice different spheres of experience. And you might initially do a little bit of encouraging, encouraging to rest within the body. Allowing awareness to be infused through the physical body. Noticing the quality of your physical experience at the moment. Perhaps noticing where there's some degree of ease, relaxation. some degree of pleasure.
and noticing other perhaps other parts, other places where there's perhaps some discomfort or tension or physical pain. And allowing awareness to move often it's our thoughts that stick us to a particular part of our experience thoughts of liking wanting more of the same more ease, more comfort, or thoughts of not liking. How can I make this go away? Allowing awareness to move like a butterfly just landing on this leaf and then that one sensitive to the actual experience No need to reach out to it. Relaxing back. every now and again. Just checking the quality of effort or energy. Is it possible to relax back a little bit more and still be present? Relaxing into awake awareness.
not trying to see anything clearly internally or externally. Just creating the conditions for a new way of seeing, a new way of attending through simply being aware. And notice any pleasure, contentment that comes through the mind being aware, being present to the moments as they arise. And resting in that. Can you notice the flavors of matter naturally present in the awareness?
so same as yesterday there's a uh, 10 minutes or so for anyone perhaps um different people to yesterday just to give um different people a chance who anything that that uh perhaps caught your interest in the practice uh perhaps when you felt particularly present or um engaged in what was happening love to hear from you as i said yesterday can be quite ordinary moments it's, it's not um you know i'm not asking for any sort of particularly uh uh, oh, here we go. Thank you, Sarah. I noticed at the beginning of that last sit that um, I've had quite a lot of tension around my jaw and my neck. Um, and the, as well as a physical adjustment and um, like a dropping back into the back of the body and the back of the neck and the back of the head. Um, if I, um, at the same time, uh, noticed that I could let go of the aversion to the discomfort, and that sort of, it sort of married up with slight physical adjustment. And it made it easier. I guess it was more productive or it was more satisfying to, um, to notice that I wasn't pushing, <laughs> to notice that I wasn't kind of sticking my chin out or kind of gritting my teeth in a kind of mental way. But it, it, I don't know, I don't know how that happened because the first part of the sit, it was quite uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do with it really. Just, uh, yeah, sounds but, like maybe you recognised that the that the aversion. Maybe at some point you were clearer that the aversion was there to the discomfort and the tension. And yes. um, yeah, I'm curious about the letting go, whether that was just something that, that happened or something that you did actively. Because sometimes a letting, a letting go can come just from recognition. It, it, it just happens on its own. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious about that. I think it was not me trying to do that. I think it was more me um, allowing allowing it. Or, like, mm. yeah, like kind of rela relaxing around it. Lovely, thank you. Thank you very much. Karen, um, yeah, Karen. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I found it interesting because I've been having problems in my eyes and headaches this last week and um, it seemed to have got better and this morning it was worse again so when we were sitting I sort of tried to think what I could do I made it a bit darker and there was a lot of um, well I suppose fear about whether I was going to get a migraine or something but something changed during it that was um, like a kind of letting go of somehow I think something you said about happiness, you can be happy with about not having to either have something or get rid of something to be happy. I think something about that um, was really helpful of just that trying to just be what, with whatever is without trying to change it. And although we said those words many times, it, it was different somehow. And I managed to um, relax into it more and I found sometimes I was almost relaxed enough to go to sleep but not quite and that was really interesting kind of playing with that um, uh, feeling of, of being relaxed but not actually asleep and that was re actually really pleasant and helpful. Great, thank you. Thank you. Can I? Uh, uh, okay, um, um, uh, Vilasini and then Aria Jai. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I had a stroke about uh, two years ago, which somewhat debilitated my left side, especially my left hand. And I, I wouldn't, if I picked something up in my left hand, I couldn't identify it. I didn't know what I was holding. And it, it's, it's clumsy and um, um, very rather unpleasant. So that I started to do everything with my right hand. And my left, I, I stopped paying any attention to the left. Uh, and, I mean, I still used it. But yesterday, in lying down meditation, I put my left hand on my ribs and I suddenly got a very vivid internal picture of the ribs and the organs I, I mean, the, my internal, as though it was, had become an eye looking at and into my body. Mm. And I, I remember thinking, gosh, it, it's alive. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I moved it onto my leg. Um, I needed to move my leg because I was lying flat and no cushion under my um, so I bent my leg and it was as though I became aware of all the muscles uh, in, in my thigh not just the big but the small and it, it was just I, I, I somehow I, I suddenly felt respect for this left hand, which I've dismissed as useless and not not to be considered, and so and then I I continued um, to move my hand on, on my body, and I, I had image after image, and. I, I, it just was just such a totally new and different experience for that particular hand. Mm -hmm. And I remember moving my right hand over and holding it with affection and giving <laughs> it a squeeze. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and and it, it, for the rest of yesterday, I've been using my left hand as a, a, an object of sight and when we then sat up and I looked around with my eyes uh, of course it's much more vivid with your eyes what you see but it was a very similar seeing mm -hmm. um, just you know um, you, what I'm used to, and yeah. and much more vivid. Mm. Um, yeah, and sounds like sounds like awareness uh, yeah. came back online uh, through you, perhaps being just quite open in that moment. Yes, uh, yes. Well, I think when we come fresh to things, we can sort of forget the maybe the habit of oh, this left one's not really worth bothering about, mm. and actually then the experience can be quite uh, startling. See, oh, here we go. Yes. Yes. Thank you. It, it, it has been. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's lovely. Aria Jaya. Oh, can't really hear you. Can you come to the yeah. yeah. Yeah, that should be better. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I sat this morning, I was aware that. Um, I didn't settle as easily as I did on the weekend. You know, I'm trying to do some work today as well. So I was just aware that that's a little bit more um, uh, kind of in my mind. Um, but then very, very quickly, I had quite a, what felt like a real inspiration for sorting a problem. And I was aware of the elation that kind of came with the kind of like sense of like, oh my God, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, 
which which quickly faded into kind of touching into more the areas of dukkha that I'm aware of at the moment for myself and for others in particular. And I really enjoy what you've been saying in terms of like not preferencing one experience over the other, but staying with them. So I think that's just reminding me and really helping me to do that. Um, but there's quite a few situations that are causing me some anxiety and worry. So I just had a sense of like, well, what can I do? I can only really get bigger to those, those situations. And it does come with a very physical sense of like having to kind of like shake off the restriction of kind of um, anxiety and worry or feeling there's no way forward. And when I was able to do that, I just kind of like thought the only thing I can do, I can't solve any of the dukkha in the world that I would like to. <laughs> All I can do is really kindly attend. Yeah. So that kind of like, oh, what's the quality of that to, to not try and fix and solve things, but just to, to really kindly attend to them. So that's just a lovely thing to perhaps just bring more fully into, into my awareness. So yeah, mm. thank you for that. Just wanted to share yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Anyone else before we break for tea? I could say something. Diane and Dave. It's a very simple thing of uh, of just reflecting on what the quality of awareness uh, was like, and you saying it in a way the sensitivity of it. Um, just trying to distinguish it from the rest of my mind in a way, and noticing it, and yeah, feeling a sort of quality of this uh, like a sort of delicate web of awareness or something. And then just very simply noticing sometimes when something else took over, it was almost like it just somehow just got dissolved back into this sort of bigger quality of maybe my mind thinking about tea break or whatever it was, a few things. It was almost like a sort of the awareness was this very fine thing that just immediately sort of just so dissolved into this bigger thing. And then, then it would just emerge out of it again and suddenly be present. It was, it was just, that was all I noticed. It was it was quite lovely, really. But I had an image of the awareness being like a, a like a very fine, not exactly a cobweb, but it was a, it was like a very fine thing. And the other the other, other the other noticing of um, maybe it was like liking something, not liking something, felt more gross, and I could sort of feel the sort of slightly deadening effect of being absorbed. In it. Yeah, that, that was it, really. Mm, great coming thank you out. yeah that's what i was thinking that's like the comings and goings of uh awareness and and well and comings and goings of the mind how the mind moves how it how it's always changing but there can be something that's noticing all of that something that's that, that that's able to see the sort of deadening effect it's able to see the the sort of um i'm get, almost getting a lacy with this delicate uh yeah yeah from type thing yeah 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 lovely thank you very much samata got your hand up <laughs> um yes I, I just touched into something in that sit uh, something very sad and um well then i noticed a judgmental thought towards myself and just staying with all that um yeah, quite a sense of uh, dukkha. But just by staying there with it, well, the words came to my mind, kindly awareness. But it's like you say, the metta, it's just there when we're aware. It feels to me when I can have that wider awareness, then metta is there already. It, it didn't take away, it hasn't taken away the, the sense of um, sadness. But it makes it different. My heart softens and I can stay with the difficult mm. experience. So there's both things there in a way, that the metta 
and the difficult experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and we're definitely not trying to make anything go away. Uh, yeah, it's it's more that um, you know, can yeah as you're experiencing how we hold that makes a difference to the experience. You can recognize that that kindly awareness is present to it. It's really crucial. It, it always seems like that kindly awareness, it just arrives when you need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was thinking as well in what you said, um, you recognize dukkha in the so we recognize that quality of dukkha so there's there's awareness and within that awareness there's a clear knowing of what was happening yeah yeah thank you now maybe the the knowing is uh, what allows that softening and the kindness to be there i, th I think that the, the knowing has some degree of a sort of dharma perspective in it, it says oh dukkha <laughs> so and, and in some ways that it's, it's just it's so universal it's so much part of the, it's like we recognize the, the conditioned nature of experience, the human nature, there's so much in, implicit in that simple recognition. Oh, Dukkha, yes, uh, yeah. And, and that's a relief, I think, it's a relief to our being. Mm. Mm. Also, your, your uh, reminders this morning, just to ask ourselves, is that helpful? Is this helpful? I wasn't conscious of that, but you just talking just now, maybe, you know, it's there, you've um, dropped it into our mind. It's, mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, all of you. So let's have a, uh, I'll make it 12.01. Let's come to start again at, um, by 12.15 and we'll just have a short sit and I've got a, a reading from Bhante uh, to finish with. Okay, so just taking that awareness into stretching your legs, having a drink, whatever it is to do now. Keep, keep close to home. Mm. So I'll read something from Bhante from Living with Awareness. which sort of straddles what we're talking about today uh, and what we'll be talking about tomorrow specifically. Um, and then we'll have about 10 minutes to sit and then um, I'll just uh, sign off with um, suggesting a particular sort of application for mindful observation today. Mind can contemplate mind. The ability to make consciousness reflexive, to become aware that we are aware, to know that we know, seems to be a specifically human characteristic. The human mind has the capacity to turn its attention back on itself and take a questioning attitude even to consciousness itself. In other words, although your state of consciousness is subjective, when you think about it, or become aware of it, you make it into an object, a mental object, a dharma. You can turn you, the subject, into you, the object. For example, you don't just experience sense desire, you know that you experience it. Your desire for sense experience is part of your subjectivity. But when you become aware of this desire, you make it into an object.
So I know that some of you did manage to listen to the walking meditation yesterday, which is great. Uh, if you're able to do that um, every day or most days during the week, that would, that would be great. That would be really great. Um, and uh, of course, the, you, you could do the walking meditation without the, the, with the track, without listening. Uh, if you wanted to incorporate what I'm going to suggest for today, which is seeing, uh, focusing on seeing. This is a tricky one. It's, it's so automatic to see and uh, for it to happen automatically and automatically with the view, I'm seeing. I'm the one who's seeing. I'm the one who's looking. Oh, look what I can see. Uh, I'm looking at that. Um, that. That's not just a linguistic thing, is it? That, that's, after, that's how, uh, if you like, that, that sense of self is, is um, appropriating that sense experience. Uh, there's a firm relationship. Um, so that can be noticed. That can be noticed if we're just recognizing, maybe just reminding yourself in, in the same way as reminding yourself to be aware in sitting practice. Uh, recognizing, oh, seeing is happening. Seeing is happening. So there's a bit less attention focused on the objects of sight. And there's a, again, that closer to home, it's, it's, a, it's a function of uh, our being. It's a function of, uh, it's a sense function to, to see or to look. Uh, so looking that more, more focused um, approach and seeing more open, soft eyes. Uh, so maybe you pick up, maybe you notice that, that uh, self in action, that sense of self. Ah. Oh, right. And that can be really interesting to catch, um, seeing, seeing how it operates, seeing how it works. And sometimes perhaps it'll just be seeing. Uh, it'll be sort of clear of that uh, particular sort of self-conglomeration. So give it a go. And, and of course, feel free to, to uh, uh, include any of the other. That's what you might want to, to do nothing and practice seeing. Uh, yeah. So there was just a question. I think the answer came up. There was a question about um, couldn't find the walking meditation, but uh, it, it is on the YouTube channel. The answer was there. So that's where you'll be able to find it. Uh, and yesterday's recordings are up. I think the last two days recordings are up on the YouTube channel. Um, they take quite a while. Uh, so um, yeah, so they, they generally go up in the evening of the day. The, what I read just now, there was a question, um, will that go up? Uh, most of my, I have, I have my little books. I have these books that I've been keeping. This is the first one. It's from, I started it in 1986. So most of what I quote uh, are just written in these little books. So I'm afraid they, I'll try and um, give you details about them, but all I can say about that one is it's from Living with Awareness. It's Bante Living with Awareness, probably in the mind section because it's about mind. Um, so, so I don't, I don't have typed copies or anything like that. Uh, yeah, but if you really want it, there's usually a way that you can um, find it. Okay, so I'll leave it there, and I uh, hope you have a good afternoon, and um, hope to see you. Uh, see you at five today. Yeah. Okay. Mm.